Growing up as a young car enthusiast, I did a lot of stupid shit. But that's how you learn, right? You learn by making mistakes and growing from them. I learned that putting really, really loud aftermarket exhaust on not your car isn't really worth the hassle. My mom was pissed that I straight piped no. her Mustang while she was gone at work. Anyway, I was told a hundred thousand times that what I was doing was stupid, but nobody ever actually told me why it was stupid. So that's exactly what we're gonna talk about right now. These are the biggest mistakes that you can make as a new car enthusiast. You know, maybe you've heard the saying before, the cheapest Ferrari that you can buy will be the most expensive Ferrari that you can own. It's a great quote and it's extremely true. And what I mean by that is the cheapest version of something will inevitably cost you more long-term than an already sorted thing. Super good deals from someone that's disconnected from the market isn't really a thing anymore. Once boomers started using the internet, that shit all went down the drain. So that $11,000 S2000 that sounds like a bargain barn find is realistically gonna need a minor restoration. I'd have to imagine that the suspension and all of its bushings are probably gonna need a dressing. It's probably got high miles, so we all know damn well the thing's gonna burn oil when you hit that VTEC. And the trans probably grinds into gear, but you didn't know that until after you paid for it because you didn't want to redline a stranger's car. A trans rebuild coilover, suspension bushings, timing chain tensioners, probably a clutch and new piston rings later. And you're talking about a really hefty bill on just parts, let alone labor and the while you're in there. When you could have just bought kind of a sorted one in the first place with less miles and a detailed documentation for what will inevitably cost less money long-term and probably then also be worth more at the end of the day. Now you might be thinking to yourself, but Sean, Aren't you literally the guy who strictly buys basket case cars to nurse them back to the life they deserve? Well, yeah, but I do sacrifice a lot of my time into learning how to do that labor myself. And I do extensive research before purchasing cars to see common issues and kind of price them out. And then I give myself a specific budget to work with that won't let me completely screw myself. Even though I do, usually end up completely screwing myself. And if you're a sane person and not okay with wasting all your time on fixing a cheap enthusiast car, don't do it. It's a trap. Save me. Please help. I have a real problem. And this goes not only for buying cars, but for modifying them as well. Take coilovers, for example. I get asked almost every day, what's the best coilover for the money? I'm kind of on a budget and I don't want to spend a ton of money. What do you recommend? And my go-to is always BC Racing BR Series. It comes in right in that $995,000, $50 range. And it has a lot of features that you really don't see from other brands until you start getting into that $1,500, $1,600 plus range. But then they went and got a $400 set of no-name coilovers from Amazon or eBay. And then they get mad when they have to mess around with no instructions using spring compressors to use the stock top hats making the ride extra when it's low because the height adjustments based on the location of the spring perch so the shocks only have 30 percent of its intended travel and probably handles worse than it did from the factory and then several months later that maxed out shock that you've been bouncing around on is going to blow out you can't get a hold of them for replacement because this no-name company doesn't actually have a customer service team so you go and buy the BCBRs I suggested in the first place. Now your suspension setup has costed you almost $1,500 instead of the $995 the first time around. You get the adjustable body. So the ride height adjustment is going to be separate from that spring preload. You get the adjustable damping standard. And most applications have a built-in camber plate on that top mount already on it, just ready to bolt that whole thing in and go. And best of all, in the off chance that you do have a goddamn issue, the customer service team is top notch with actual product specialists. My rule of thumb for this is quite literally, if it sounds too good to be true, well, it probably is. Read reviews, do research, be careful, please. Arguably the most important on this list is never, ever, 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 ever try to outdrive your skill level and or keep your mother ego in check, all right? I've seen it happen a hundred times. Some dude who's only had a license for a couple years who just went and bought a 400 horsepower Mustang shows up to the car meet thinking this barn getting freaking junior because he can slide his car around the same corner near his house all the time. So of course he goes to slide the car leaving the meet, right? Trying to show off and then when things get a little out of hand, dude overcorrects directly into a freaking pole because he wasn't visually scanning and he didn't consider all the variables that are out of his control. The same thing happens in motorsport environments too, you know? Someone will have their ego threatened and they will push the car too hard and ultimately end up in an off-track incident or even worse, you damage your car or someone else's. The saying literally goes, check yourself 
before you wreck yourself, bud. Another big mistake I see people make all the time when starting out is that they develop a nearly obsessive attitude for kind of a single make or a single model. They think damn near everything else sucks and that their idea of the best thing is the only best thing, which, you know, it's totally fine. I don't wanna make it sound like you can't have your opinions or be an expert in one concentrated area, but the kid that's obsessed with naturally aspirated domestic cars and thinks imports are trash without realizing, you know, that GM vehicles are mostly built in Mexico might never experience the magic of a high revving, lightweight, well-balanced chassis to the likes of a Honda S2000. And you know, sometimes that script is flipped around too. Sometimes the Nissan Z guy thinks European sports sedans are complete and utter sh**. And so he won't ever get to experience the gut punching power of an AMG V8 simply based on stubbornness. There are so many cool, fun and unique and quirky cars out there, most of which have a unique purpose. In denying the experience of certain things because you think only one does it the best is such a lame way to be an enthusiast. And it really puts a damper on your credibility at the end of the day. So I'm not saying you have to respect all builds, but once you open up your mind and you learn about what other cars have to offer, I promise that you will find yourself connecting with other car enthusiasts more easily. You know, Maybe you'll even stumble across opportunities to drive some other really unique cars and find a fun car that checks all your boxes and then some that you didn't already know about. Trust me, you will thank me later. Do not fall for favoritism. Having a plan with your vehicle is a life and a money saver. When I first got my license, my first legal car was a 97 Cavalier. I called her the neutral drop queen. Anyway, I proceeded to chop off the exhaust and buy random for it whenever I could. You know, told their intakes, tail lights, headers, just little stupid that wasted my money, essentially. You know, it didn't make the car quicker. It made my car inevitably harder to sell and really made the money I spent on it kind of a complete waste of funds. Now, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing whatever the f they want to their own vehicle. But if you don't have a plan, it's really easy to not follow the plan path and end up with a bunch of really random sh in your car and it can really make you look kind of tacky. This goes double, especially for cars that for a lack of better term, aren't worth modifying. Now, I totally get it. I can't keep my hands off anything either. I wanna modify literally everything just for funsies, but trust me when I tell you, I learned the hard way sticking unnecessary money into something just for the laws is keeping you from buying that dream car of yours. Because as a car enthusiast, the penny saved is a penny earned thing is extremely literal. Because that $90 eBay cold air intake on your CRV could become $90 you put towards your S2000 fund. You know what I'm saying? Just be smart about it. Don't go balls to the walls without a real plan to follow. And finally, using the right tool for the job is absolutely critical to having a good experience with cars. Trying to work on your own car with the wrong tools will make you never want to work on your car ever again. And doing your own work is damn near essential to being able to afford to do anything with this goddamn hobby, unless you're some kind of rich guy anyway. I've watched way too many people strip nuts and bolts and screws and mess up timing and ruin engines and get in some really messy pickles because they were kind of improvising on the job and they kind of straight up quit cars because of these mistakes. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do and you gotta hammer a 12 point socket onto a locking wheel lug nut to get your wheels off because the dealership won't sell you a wheel key for the VIN of a salvage six gen ZL1 hot off the auction lot. But you're wasting your time out here trying to reinvent the wheel. Now I get it. Tools, they are expensive. And I'm guilty of trying to improvise with what I have too. But it's always, it's quite literally a gamble. In nine times out of 10, the house wins and I've wasted hours of my time just to go back and buy whatever the hell tool that it was that I needed in the first place, plus some hardware, probably an easy out. But it's kind of a double layered statement as well because I also use the phrase when people ask me recommendations on wheels, tires, and suspension. You know, if you have a vehicle that sees a moderate amount of track days a year and really likes to push the car in a competitive setting, I would totally recommend a race oriented tire like a Pilot Sport Cup 2. But if you're looking for a performance oriented tire for a daily driver, something that does long trips, you know, it's kind of a commuter, a set of Sport Cup 2s aren't going to last you more than eight to 12,000 miles. You probably won't ever get them hot enough to make them do what they do best, especially if you're on the street. So it's kind of wasted money, right? You know, whereas a Pilot Sport All Season 4 DWS 06 Plus would be more than enough performance for a streetcar without all those sacrifices or the extra cost. You know, the same thing goes with coilovers. If you want the $5,000 
racing coilovers for your 350Z, more power to you. But if you don't competitively track your vehicle, you're kind of just throwing that money away. You know, where BCBR might be the perfect coilover for you for a fifth of the price. So always use the right tool for the job. It will always save you time and money. So if you are a new car enthusiast, I sincerely hope this can help you not make some of the same mistakes that I fell for. If you're not new here, what are some mistakes that you guys have made as young car enthusiasts? Please leave a comment, let me know. I'd love to hear all about it and I'll try to respond to as many comments as I possibly can. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with all the crazy stuff that we got going on over here. My name is Sean from Fitment Industries, SeanB.fi on Instagram. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, peace. <laughs>